Hello there. Welcome to this pre-recorded um, session of MHTV. We've got a fantastic guest with us who are just going to introduce themselves in a moment. But before we get started, just to say, um, obviously, because we're not live, you can't really join in with us in the same way that you would normally do. But we really always like to hear from you. We love to know what's going on for you, what you think about the guests, if you have any questions for them. And as ever, you can join in on the hashtag MHTV if you have questions, or you can address um, Sabrina directly because she has a Twitter account too and we'll be publicising that. So um, please, if you're interested in the subjects we're going to be talking about, and we're going to be ranging over a few subjects tonight, um, from green health to, to working abroad, all those sorts of um, issues, please do get in contact with any questions you've got that are relevant to today. All right, thank you very much. Let's go to Sabrina. Tell us a little bit about yourself, Sabrina. Oh, hi. So thanks firstly for inviting me. Um, so yeah, I'm Sabrina. I'm a mental health nurse currently working in Tasmania in Australia. Um, but I did qualify uh, as a mental health nurse back at um, Nottingham University in 2017. So I was working for Sussex Partnership Trust for about three years before moving over here in February. So yeah, my main speciality is acute mental health in patients. So. Fantastic. And so we crossed paths and I came across you perhaps on, on Twitter and when we were talking to other nurses about sort of green health, environmental issues, sustainability and healthcare and things like that. And I wondered if you mm -hmm. could tell me you know, how you first got interested in kind of green issues and how they became part of your nursing journey. Yeah, so it's interesting because when I think about it, if you ask me when I was a student nurse, um, back in 2016, um, whether I'd be, you know, doing sustainable healthcare promotion and things like that, I would think, what are you talking about? Um, so it's funny how things unfolded. So it's quite a recent journey for me. And I would say it's not sustainable healthcare was not a concept that I was introduced to or taught about when I was at university training to be a nurse. So it was definitely something that came initially from my personal experiences. Um, anyone who knows me, I'm very passionate about traveling. And so um, with my experiences of going to the Philippines, um, Indonesia, and seeing the impact of global plastic pollution in those places, you know, some of the most remote and beautiful places, and yet you're still seeing a miscellaneous Coke can, things like that, but even in your day-to-day -day life and mm -hmm. especially with um, what's been going on with the pandemic and seeing even when you're walking down the street and looking at the pavement and there's uh, face masks that are just being completely inappropriately disposed of. And so it was these kinds of things that I was seeing in my day-to-day -day personal life that really kind of drew my attention um, to it, but I guess it didn't come immediately and it's something that I think in hospitals and as nurses or doctors, we kind of feel that our workplace is kind of a bit like a bubble. And so yeah. what happens in our home life is kind of separate to or yeah. completely yeah. separate from our day to day work life. Um, but as time went on, I was sort of a year and a bit into my role as a newly qualified nurse mm -hmm. and you know, just talking to patients uh, and service users um, about sustainable health care. But it, it came a bit more organically than that, I guess, because I remember speaking to one of the service users and they came up to the clinic. I was giving them their medication and I remember them asking me, so what happens to this plastic cup? And I said, it goes in the bin. He said, oh, are we not recycling them? And I said, no, like we're not recycling. And then it just it just made me think, why yeah. is it that we, we are doing these things in our own homes? We're recycling, mm. we're, we're not, you know, um, using disposable cutlery or plates necessarily every day. So why are we doing it on the ward? Mm. And so I had this inner conflict of, you know, how do I marry the two? Because I'm practicing in one way at home, but then at work, here I am where it was kind of the norm for staff and service users to be using plastic cups, plastic cutlery, polystyrene cups for coffees and teas. And yeah, something clicked and I thought this isn't okay and we need to change this because this is so wasteful and so unnecessary and so damaging to the environment. And it wasn't just me noticing it. 
other service users were noticing it too. Um, and I guess actually around that time, um, I was quite fortunate because that particular NHS trust was um, working with an organisation called Care Without Carbon. So mm -hmm. they launched this Dare to Care programme, which was kind of trying to um, educate and motivate staff to try and engage in small green behaviours at work and try and promote mm -hmm. stories, you know, like riding your bike to work and things like that. So I remember getting engaged in that and awkwardly posing for a photo with my bike because I was riding my bike to work. Um, but at the time, I wasn't thinking, oh, I'm being so green. I'm a green nurse. It was just at that time, I was doing it for financial reasons to save money and I lived nearby. It just made sense. But yeah. it actually framed it in a different way. And actually, I was like, no, I, I am actually being green in doing this and it's something that is accessible and other people can do so I guess that was another reason and then I guess back in um 2017 as well when I qualified there was Blue Planet 2 with David Attenborough and I really think that kind of opened the conversation to a wider audience and really yeah. kind of even if you're someone that doesn't travel or you know it just really yeah. kind of highlighted the need for us to be looking at this kind of stuff more deeply. So yeah, I just wanted to realign my values with my mm. clinical practice. Um, that was coming really across really strongly, isn't it? From, from when you were telling that story about this, you know who you are as a person and you know who you who you are, how you want to practice as a nurse. And then mm. sometimes just being aware of any conflicts and working them through. And I think sometimes our work lives are so task focused and so stressful that you actually yeah. don't see, you don't marry up who you are, who you bring in your whole self to work that kind of weird yeah. phrase that people keep going on about. So, you know, thinking about how you be a nurse in the best way that you can and making sure yeah. that that, um, that chimes with who you are as a person, because it should do, because our code of conduct mm -hmm. is a really positive code of conduct. If you don't chime with the code of conduct in your personal life, yeah. maybe take a look at your personal life. So it's a good thing to think about, isn't it? And I get the other thing I loved about the, when you were talking about that was that you were having people conversations or human conversations between people it doesn't matter if you're using services or delivering services you know we're all we absolutely are in this together and if we mm. don't look at it as a whole we are going to we're not going to be successful and I think yeah. that's really important too so having those spaces to be able to feel at work and not be so shut down that it's really too difficult to even think about to be able to think about you know why am I doing things not just what am I doing but also being able to have those kind of conversations with people that are not just about how sick are you today <laughs> it's got really exactly. negative limiting conversations but actually looking at the kind of shared humanity that we have and I think that's so important for therapeutic working so that's really interesting to hear that so when you started to have these um ideas that actually I need to do something different or there are opportunities for me to do something different what did you do how did you get started on on, ch on making changes or thinking about making changes well I guess my main focus at that time was I mean I was yeah a newly qualified band five nurse and so mm -hmm. you know you, you you can start with the small things and that's absolutely yeah. okay and perfectly valid and perfectly needed because they do avalanche into bigger things and so mm -hmm. at the time it was just it was annoying me far too much, um, you know, seeing how much of the plas disposable plastics were going in the bin. So I remember speaking to my manager about it. And at the time we were fortunate because we were having um, uh, management colleagues who were becoming a lot more open to the idea of, you know, anyone um, within the hierarchy at work of sort of instigating change and kind of moving towards this kind of more leader leader um style of leadership so that you know you're trying to flatten the hierarchy and basically enable people at all levels to act on things that they want to change in the workplace so that was really great because it it meant that my manager was really responsive and encouraging and kind of gave me the permission to go okay so you don't want these single use items what can we use instead and so that's when I was kind of working even with the ward clerk, with my manager, with um, the estates team, because mm. um, you can't you can't do it alone. And so I said, well, is there can we find other alternatives um, that are still safe to use on a ward within mental health? Because that's mm. 
obviously something we need to consider is, is risk um, and you know how we still enable a safe environment for people that is still uh, more sustainable. So um, we looked at procurement and essentially located and invested in some reusable um, plates and cutlery and cups for service users uh, to use. Um, they were shatterproof, so they were still safe. And yeah, it really meant that we had to use a sort of multidisciplinary approach as well and, you know, getting everyone on board. And also I did notice or have noticed that this kind of, um, this arena is very much um, headed by still estates teams, um, non-clinical people, which obviously we need everyone in all expertise to be working on it. But I felt like there wasn't much of a clinical input into how, okay. you know, start recycling or start these things. And, and um, yeah, so it was, yeah, we needed to effectively communicate at all levels. Um, and I did find actually face-to-face -face was the best approach. And I think... Yeah. Ultimately, we are working with our service users and I didn't feel like they were being listened to when it comes to that, because obviously, as we were saying earlier about identity and um, and also, you know, service users um, having their own stories outside of their care. And yeah. you know, many of them have their own values in terms of sustainable living. And so having those people voicing their concerns and what they're expecting us as a service really kind of pushed me to go look this needs to be looked into so I was very fortunate that at that time um yeah the leadership model was around and was being encouraged and so I felt empowered as a nurse um, to say something and try and get these things done, basically. So, yeah, we got those items taken off the procurement list and found those other ones. So very, very simple, nothing revolutionary. Um, and it's interesting because when you, when you, when I was speaking to other services about it, some of them, you know, they were already doing those things. And so for them, it wasn't a new thing. Um, so it really kind of... Um, it really taught me that, you know, every service is going to have their own needs in this yeah. area. So just saying, oh, you know, everywhere should have reusable cups. I mean, we were able to do it because we weren't doing it and we did have the facilities to kind of clean those cups, you know, because there is the idea of, oh, well, the need yeah. for infection control, but also dispelling those myths of, around infection control, because I know there were definitely mm. barriers yeah. there initially and trying to dispel those myths um mm. but actually making the most of the resources we had and realizing oh we've actually got a steriliser in the kitchen so we could you that's know that's what that is <laughs> sterilize the cups so yeah you know that's not an issue we can work mm. around this mm. um, so yeah it's interesting because two or three things that you've said that really jump out so one is the fact that that there were areas of really good practice that no one seemed to know about. <laughs> so they weren't, you know, we weren't all sharing our good practice. Um, mm -hmm. And again, the word hierarchy really sort of jumped out as well. And, and also this idea about how do you understand the systems you work in? Because I think the NHS can be quite impenetrable sometimes, you know, and every time you go up a grade, you almost see the world anew when you realise there's another layer on top and then another layer on top of mm -hmm. you, you, um, your eyes start to open more and more, I think, as you stay in the NHS, and for good and bad. Um, but it's something about understanding the system you're working in and how to use it as well and how to, man well, not manipulate is the wrong word, I want to use, but how to actually get your needs met within it. Because mm. it's about knowing the right person and you're absolutely right about face-to-face -face contact. You can send emails all day to overburdened emails accounts and nobody will answer them. But if you go and knock on someone's door, I have a cup of tea very shortly you start to move things along so what can we learn from your work what went well what would you do differently if you're going to do it again i'd say that um you know within the workplace managers do need to be giving that permission um to their to their team to say look we we welcome your ideas 
you know, you need to create that environment where it's solution focused, okay, because people will have a number of things that they find issues with at work. And so it's having someone to create a culture where people feel empowered to lead on changes, no matter what you're banding, um, and be able to do it as a team and not do it alone. Um, so it's a real, it's a bit of a culture shift that needs to happen, really, because I know that we're getting, guide, we're slowly getting guidance in this area about how um, healthcare professionals can be more sustainable at work. But I do think mm -hmm. the challenge is actually how do we implement it in practice if yeah. we have these kinds of quite rigid hierarchical structures? And I, I can imagine that people, uh, some professionals, maybe hold these values themselves, but they feel that they can't say anything and they can't do anything about it. So they're waiting for something to happen from the top down all the time. And so I'd like to think that this kind of example kind of just illustrates that actually bottom up grassroots approaches of just having one person initially say something can actually help generate a larger discussion around it. And I think actually... I remember at the time I started, um, so I had my Twitter account and then I also had uh, set up a Twitter account for the ward that I was working on. And mm -hmm. so that was great because it really, I, I remember posting photos of the things that we were doing and, you know, using the hashtags. Mm -hmm. um, and it really helped to connect me and the ward with people outside of our bubble, outside of our yeah. echo chamber, I guess, and kind of connect with other nurses, academics, other services, not just in the trust that we were in, but elsewhere in the UK. And so that was invaluable because it showed me that there were universal challenges, but also, um, yeah. you know, there are different needs in every single service. Um, so yeah, sharing and celebrating your achievements and what you're doing can really help to inspire and motivate other people and I remember yeah. even just yeah. at a training workshop mentioning what we were doing on our ward and I uh, mentioned it to one of the other nurses and then they took it back with them to their older person's ward and then yeah. within a few weeks they'd also done the same and bought some reusable cups and so it's just this slow domino effect of you mm -hmm. know reaching people on a wider scale but also within your own uh, setting, you can mm. sort of create that change face to face. Mm. Um, oh, I love that. And I think, yeah, and I think um, I don't want to make it sound like it was an easy process either, because mm. of course there were times where I felt like I was hitting my head against a brick wall, to be honest. Um, so you have to be really, really persistent in, mm. in your communication and also giving your team uh, a rationale and a reason, not just saying that this is what's going to happen, mm. but actually helping people to understand the urgency, how it can benefit everyone, yeah. and including service users. Um, so that's really important. And then actually, you know, role modeling and practicing what you preach, I guess, as well is essential. Um, because having opinions isn't always enough, and you need to actually lead by example as well. And the other thing I thought was from it, um, just assessing what items we would be able to use, it made me think, why had the ward gotten into this habit of using such items in the first place? And it made me think about risk assessment and how important it is that we are consistently reviewing, reviewing what the actual presenting risks are, because perhaps it was something that was introduced after some other kind of material was used in a risky way. And so it was thought that um, disposable items might be a better option, but actually they can be equally risky. And so it was really important for us to be constantly assessing, mm. actually, what's the, mm. what's the rationale for this? What's the justification and reviewing mm. that and going, actually, no, this isn't, this isn't really needed anymore. Uh, and mm. if anything could be riskier. Mm. And yeah, just just very empowering for some for someone like me who's not in a management management role um, mm. to to lead to help lead on a project, mm. no matter how small, mm. and then you know be able to share it 
you know, at a conference and share it online and share it with my peers was just really an invaluable experience for my own professional development as well. So there's a couple um, of other things you've drawn in there as well. So one is about mm. knowing the history of the problem, because you're right, yeah. stuff gets lost in the midst of time. And if you go back even what, 30 years, we were recycling everything. We weren't really using plastic that much, you yeah. know, and I'm not saying that anyone wants to go back to the days of being a student nurse, sorting the bedpans out with the clouds of steam going in your face. <laughs> that's, that's no yeah. one's best way to start a day. But um, we did recycle for a long time without really realising that's what we were doing. So there's no reason why we can't with our modern adapted working styles think of another way of doing it that's equally positive. And I think the other thing about providing a rationale, so it's important to have messages that strike people's hearts, but also a really good rationale for why you're doing it in people's heads as well. Because different people get persuaded by different arguments, don't they? Mm, Beware exactly. if you're having to conquer that stuff. Some people will only listen to a spreadsheet and that's both heartbreaking because it means mm. you have to then get your Excel out. But <laughs> if you can make an, a, um, an argument that's financial as well as moral and ethical, that often really helps your case with anything. <laughs> And I guess, Absolutely. And, yeah, yeah. And the other thing you, you were saying that I just want to sort of tie in there was this idea about celebrating, taking time out to really recognise that everybody has done something towards making this move forward as well. Because I think if it's a shared celebration and a win for everybody, it's much easier to sustain than if it's one person sort of catapulting themselves into the stratosphere. Because that's not what this is about. It's not what nursing is about, really, particularly. No. And that's I think. The, Oh, no, well, I was just going to talk about, in terms of the things I'd probably do differently, mm. um, I do think, because obviously now I've moved away, and so, you know, it, I know we'll probably talk about, you know, how do we sustain this change, and I think mm. something I probably would do differently is maybe trying to build more of a, a team of like-minded people to begin with when trying to um, lead with these kinds of changes and so because then you're not doing it on your own um, I think that's so so important um, there's power in in small numbers it doesn't have to be loads of people but at least um, you know talking to people openly about your interests in this area and you know you'd be surprised how many other people are interested in it but ne but don't necessarily consider proactively doing something about it but once you suggest it they would um, but also just generally, if we're going to make a greener NHS as well, I do think the options that we start suggesting and the strategies that we kind of try and adopt, we'll need to adopt. We will need to try and make them, you know, at least as easy, if not, you know, as the as the previous um, old ways of doing things, because I did learn from this process that, you know, with the acuity on wards and the time pressures that, you know, um, nurses are under, we don't want to be necessarily adding more stress and more burden um, Definitely. and adding more time to things that we're doing. And so we need to be making these alternatives affordable as well as just as efficient and mm -hmm. timely. Because otherwise, people will just continue to choose the faster, the faster option. Yeah. So that's some definitely something that needs to be considered. Yeah. Because I knew it would be us having a conversation. I did shake down some uh, passing students last week for questions about this, and there was some real, there was real interest. I think, I think you're right to say that we have never really taught this before. And once you put it in the way of students, they're actually very open to thinking about these issues, which is really positive. Um, these students are at the start of their journey, as we politely call it. So um, one first question, well, I'll, ask, I'll, I'll tell you all the questions, you can ask them how you want. So the first one is, how do you get people to listen to you when you're when mm. you're not in power, a powerful position as such? Um, and how do you stay positive as an activist, somebody said? I don't know if you think of yourself as an activist, but um, you did mention sometimes the uh, hitting your head against the brick wall. We've all been there. <laughs> so how do you, how do you bounce back from that? <laughs> Um, one of the students, I wasn't going to ask this one, but I think it's it's important. And like, were you worried about getting into trouble at all? Which I think is a really valid question, because if you've got the whole weight of a system doing one thing and you're over here oh. saying, why don't we do something else? That can feel quite scary, even if no one's trying, even if no one's trying to be mad at you about it. It can feel quite 
it's a bit quite exposing to go against the grain, even if no one's purposely going in the other direction, but everything is just automatically assumed to run one direction and you want to go another way. So I guess we've got the how do you listen to, how do you stay positive and how do you, yeah, were you worried at all at any point? Mm, that's a really good question. Mm. Well, how do you get people to listen to you? It's tricky, particularly in this area, because I guess sometimes there's still this stereotype of being a greenie. And so, mm. you know, I guess initially I was a bit concerned that, you know, voicing these these issues that I had with the current mm. practices, that I'd be labelled as a greenie and so would instantly not really be taken as seriously, which is terrible because we should really by now be accepting that it is a climate emergency and this isn't just a niche movement. So, mm. yeah, I think getting people to listen to you is always going to be a challenge, but you need to be consistent with what you're saying and try and speak to the right people. And again, that might sound quite vague, but I think the people that you feel are open, um, that are open to change and sometimes it won't necessarily be in your direct sphere and mm. so I was pretty thankful that I was able to connect with people virtually as well uh, and academics think outside of the box in terms of who you, maybe you reach out to and it might not necessarily be other nurses it might be estates or it might be you know mm. and just basically you know succinctly putting your argument out there and it not just being an opinion Mm. And it not just being a, a kind of negatively phrased kind of, this is terrible, this is not right, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So actually explaining to people and talking to people one-to-one, -one, even over a cup of tea, dropping it in conversation and planting a seed, I think is quite effective. Mm. You don't want to be um, coming across as judging people's behaviours because, you know, people will instantly get quite defensive and will want to shoot down your argument. So I think it's treading lightly, but then also having the courage to, you know, be very clear in, in what your beliefs are and how you think as well it will improve patient or service user care as well. Because mm. it's not just about staff. And I do think there are so many positives that can and benefits that could come from more sustainable practices for service users as well, you know, for encouraging people to walk more instead of getting a taxi or whatever mm. it is, small things. Mm. So, yeah, I think we, if we start framing it and actually relating it to the care that we're giving, I think then more people will listen and take mm. it as something that is our responsibility even within mm. mental health care. It's interesting because I could hear a lot of kind of health promoting language there. I don't know if you mean to do it sometimes. No, the motivational um, interviewing. So I let get them to weigh up, weigh up the, the positives and negatives. Uh, I get them to really all the cycle of change. Yeah, so uh, one of the things that's really heartening about this is what's good for the planet is good for people. What's good for people is good for the planet, generally speaking. But that means that actually you already do have, or throughout your training in your, in your early years, you actually are developing a lot of skills and how to listen to people, how to figure mm -hmm. out what would be motivating to them, how to help them to nudge them towards healthier choices without necessarily putting your own opinion on it. And we all know, if you're trying to get anyone to change, judging them is the least effective way of moving forward. So there are lots of skills that you have or that you are developing as a nurse that will help you generally in life to make things just better but also that will help you to have these kind of conversations that, you know, push people into a situation where they're able to start thinking about things in a broader sense. So we're not talking about, you know, the bed, the, the leg in bed nine. We're talking about this person's well-being and what that means on a much bigger scale. And I think that kind of like change of scope is something that's going to be a lot more um, apparent in health than it has been. We we're very focused on tasks and now we're going to be moving a much broader spectrum and these skills are going to be essential so brilliant and and again you were saying and things that you would do differently the other thing about building a team i wonder if you had any ideas more about that so you say find people who are receptive how do you mm. how, how else did you kind of contact and look outside your own sphere so it doesn't have to just be nurses and nursing assistants and health people was there anything else that you wanted to add on that about getting people to listen to you Well, I think, um, yeah, I mean, you covered it with the kind of, you know, trying to go for a non-judgmental approach. Mm. And I think you're absolutely right. Um, 
you know, as nurses and even as student nurses, you're developing these skills every day in terms of, you know, sometimes I do find a part of the job is, you know, the skill of negotiating with people as well and trying to find a mutual common ground with someone that might pique their interest or find a way of um, making your argument relatable to them in some way so that you're not just, you know, pushing your view onto someone else. So trying to make it relatable is really important. And I found that in the process, because I know I was asked to write a blog um, that Care Without Carbon was going to use to share with, uh, with mm. staff for the trust. And I think that was great because it, I think people really um, are quite um, receptive to stories and people's yeah. personal stories about how you got into it, how you got interested mm. it, and you'd be amazed at all the different ways uh, and standpoints people have come from. And so I think sharing people's individual stories, I think, makes it um, more convincing for people because we do need the statistics and we do need to show the gravity of the of the issues. But I also think making it personal and relatable is also essential in trying to help people to kind of change their behaviours and consider alternative ways of doing things. Mm. Mm. And the other parts of the question were about, because it's not easy, is it staying positive and, you know, have you had times when you're worried and what did you do with that? Yeah, so I think there were definitely times when uh, it was quite disheartening. Um, mm. You know, you're, you're offering alternative solutions for people to use and you will still see maybe members of staff uh, are still choosing or finding a way of getting the very item that you were trying to get off the procurement list. And so <laughs> yeah, it was amazing. quite enlightening the lengths that people would go to to kind of resist. And that there was only a very small minority. But, um, you know, I guess I had to sit with that feeling. Uh, it's not a very nice feeling because you feel quite exposed. You feel like you are almost pushing yourself onto people, even though you know objectively you haven't been and so kind of sitting with that feeling but then reflecting on it and actually that's where I think the um you know celebrating the efforts on social media was good because it helped kind of offer alternative perspectives so that you weren't just almost feeling run down by some of the negative things that were happening mm. closer to home and the things you're seeing and so it just balanced it out a bit but you know, you can't completely deny those feelings altogether. Mm. But you do feel, you can feel exposed, uh, especially mm. if you feel like, yeah, you are the only person that is advocating mm. for these kinds of things. And so, yeah, I've found that even in my new job now, just being a bit more open from the beginning about my interests um, has really helped me kind of recognise who in the team is you know, yeah. also interested in this kind of thing and who might want to help in the future, but not rushing as well. And I think there can be this idea in your mind that, you know, it changes linear. And I knew from theory that, you know, change isn't linear, but then I was actually experiencing it firsthand. And mm -hmm. there are always going to be times when you feel like, what you're doing is not the right thing or that people don't want to and you should stop. But you just have to remember that it's it's the persistence. Um, as long as, you know, you still have the justification for it. But, you know, being persistent with your, with your um, opinions and your um, suggestions, I guess. Yeah. But it's not easy, no. <laughs> I think it's well, one of the things about working in teams, particularly kind of health teams, is you get all different kinds of characters. And, you know, the, you do get the old prickly one who is just <laughs> absolute pain. <laughs> and, and sometimes I think resistance isn't personal. It feels very personal. If you're trying to spearhead or lead a change and somebody is even disagreeing or asking questions about it, that's not about you. And I think it's really hard. I struggle with that sometimes. You have to take a step back and go, actually, is what this person is. If everyone has a different function in the team, some people are sort of cheerleaders and implementers. Some people are the people who raise questions. Whilst that can be really... Uh, it's really important to hear what they say because it can help you refine an idea or make it better or provide an, a rationale for it or make you question yourself or even make you think, actually, thinking about what they've said, 
they are wrong. This is this is a better way of doing it. And I get that they they don't like it, but that's not about our interaction. That's about how people cope with change, how people take you know different wider environmental issues seriously or not, how people feel their role is. And I think it's important to hear everything, even the stuff that's really uncomfortable, and that can be difficult. But actually, if you just file it as learning, whether it's learning you can learn from or learning you just need to understand what that person feels, it, it, it takes the sting out of it a little bit because I think it can be exhausting do, mm. doing something that other people necessarily think is good, but they don't put their time and energy in in the same way. And that could be anything. It could be a kind of social justice or racial justice issue. It could be an environmental issue. It could be just a disagreement in the team about how best to provide care. But, you know, there are ways that we can disagree without being absolutely horrible to each other. And I think, you know, nursing teams do give you a space to do that when they're working at their best. <laughs> That's the thing. I don't want to get too political, but I do course, think yeah. we're going through a time where we are. And I think social media in that sense hasn't helped because, mm. you know, we're so used to our echo chambers of, you know, only surrounding ourselves with people that think the same way. And actually it's healthy mm. for there to be a bit of discomfort in the kind of differences and opinions that you're going to have with people around you. And it's how you deal with it and how you say how you move forward with that, because mm. you need everyone on board and, yeah, and you need the service users on board as well because there's no there's no point implementing these changes and mm. it's maybe things that they themselves aren't going to want to participate in as well. It's a mm. team effort, so yeah. so yeah, absolutely. I did used to <laughs> used to have a colleague at work who I disagree with about almost everything all the time. We're great friends, but we disagree a lot. And I remember one time saying to him, "Oh, I can't believe you think that. I think that's wrong." And he goes, but "Nikki, I I could agree with you." But then both of us would be wrong. And how would that help? I was like, oh, this guy. <laughs> but between us, because we all had such different opinions, the middle ground we landed on was often quite helpful. You know, and I mm. think there is something to be said about looking to find that middle ground and, and detoxify things so that they are acceptable to all. So we've talked a little bit about, you know, how you've got involved in these issues, talked a bit about your activism and and you know, and staying positive. I think that leads us into what's the future holding for you in your new country. So you're now nursing in a completely different system. Uh, tell us about that. Tell us about how things are. Yeah, I'd love to. Um, so, yeah, as I mentioned earlier, I moved to Tasmania, Australia. It's a little old island off the mainland of Australia uh, back in February. So I've been working as a mental health nurse on one of the inpatient mental health units here in Hobart mm -hmm. uh, since April. And so, um, yeah, I guess what struck me is the fact that you can fly so many miles across the other side of the world and yet <laughs> there's still the same similar universal issues uh, around sustainability and very similar um, needs for it. Um, mm. But, yeah, I guess um, things that I found different are the ways in which I'm trying to connect with people like like-minded people I guess I think in the UK um I was able to connect with quite a few people through Twitter professionally mm -hmm. for nursing um which really was a massive help and I and I know back in the UK um the CEO of the trust I was working for was really transparent and really uh supportive on there and was pointing me in the right direction whereas here, it's definitely been a bit more of a challenge trying to find a way of speaking to the right people. Um, but I think it's um, it's something that I'm navigating. And I think it's exciting because I I remember a few months ago, I just sort of I said in the office, I was like, oh, yeah, when I was in the UK, I was doing X, Y, Z, like sustainability stuff. Mm -hmm. And I think the clinical nurse coordinator is senior. Mm -hmm overheard and he was he was like oh that's great we we had some nurses who were interested in recycling but they've now gone would you be able to help mm -hmm. and so it's just from that openness in dropping it in conversation in the nursing mm -hmm. office even mm -hmm. that that's led me now to link in with a sustain health sustainability workforce that they have for Tasmania including the hospital that I'm working at which I wasn't expecting to find, but alas, there is one, which is fantastic. So 
yeah, now I'm trying to get recycling um, implemented on them, on the mental health unit that I'm working on. But it's interesting because even within just one hospital, there are discrepancies across the wards. So mm. it's quite different because the mental health ward where I am, or there's three wards, but um, we are still part of a main general hospital. And so when I was trying to find ways of getting recycling onto the ward, it turned out that you know, the maternity ward had already had those facilities. And so I'm thinking, oh, why don't we have that? Mm. And so it's just trying to um, trying to get a standardised process across the hospital. So that's where the task force is going to be really important. So, yeah, trying to find those networks um, has been a challenge, but I'm getting there. Mm. Um, but, you know, there's still... Um, there's still a want for more sustainable practices. I mean, the other day um, I was nursing somebody who was using their leave off the ward specifically to take their own personal recycling rubbish mm -hmm. to the nearby supermarket to recycle it because we weren't doing it on the ward. And so, again, mm -hmm. it just shows, you know, it's, you know, it's not just um, people like me that want it, but it's the mm -hmm. people that we're working with that want it as well. Um, so yeah, it's very much an exciting learning curve here mm. and I'm hoping to, they've got a local, um, Tasmanian mental health nursing symposium next year. Okay. So I might try and submit an abstract, um, and see if I can present or, you know, do a poster or something just to share mm. some of those ideas from the UK that I was involved in over mm. here so we'll see what happens um got a couple of yeah, questions from dave if you're okay for those as well he snuck them into the oh. whatsapp i thought he might so um uh -huh. they're about Oz, they're about living in Oz and, and taz so uh, is it easier to be green in australia what's the psychology of the australian population well that is a big question you perhaps don't need to answer that one specifically and have, have they got have they got more of a sense of sort of green greenness more aware of the environment um, he also wants to know about cycling. Is it better weather for commuting or is this just an incorrect view for a rainy and grey UK? <laughs> so tell it's us a little tricky. bit about kind of like how it's different in your new environment. Yeah, it's tricky because I can't really speak for the entirety of Australia. So I can only really speak for my <laughs> old experience in Hobart, which is a very regional city. Yeah. So... Yeah, I found, I mean, yeah, there's recycling here, just not all over the hospital. Um, there is, again, it's it's similar in the sense that, like some of the hospitals in the UK, they're trying to establish, you know, bike parking at the hospital and things like that. But I haven't yet had the courage to um, <laughs> use my bike to go to work, but that is going to be something that I'll do in the future. Mm -hmm. Um but yeah, that I wouldn't say they're necessarily behind or ahead. It's just different. Um, mm. A few months ago when I was walking along one of the beaches, they had all these refill water taps to try and, you know, get people to reuse their bottles instead of buying bottles of water. So, you know, there's little things that I see here that they don't do in the UK, but equally a lot of similarities. It's not that different. So, yeah. Mm. Okay, well, that makes sense. And also, don't forget, if you say you're not biking yet, you're about to hit summer as we descend into winter. So uh, do do post some pictures of you enjoying the sunshine for us. <laughs> we'll enjoy oh, seeing that. Um, <laughs> I guess we need to sort of finish up now, but is there anything that you, you wanted just to, to leave people with as, as sort of like part of the final message, really? Mm. I was just going to say to anyone out there who has any kind of interest in this area, honestly, just talk to the people that are around you, whether that's face to face or virtually, just reach out. You'd be surprised how rewarding some of the conversations can be. And don't, it sounds cheesy, but don't be afraid to put yourself out there, I guess, because it really hasn't at all been all negative for me. And it's been such a positive experience. Mm. Um, and the fact that I'm still talking about it now, you know, two and a half years on mm. from that says a lot, mm. really. And so just, yeah, have, have the courage to speak up about the things that you'd like to change, but do it smartly and speak to the right people. <laughs> Nobody can top that advice. That's amazing. Thank you so, so much for your time. I really appreciate that. And good night, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye. <laughs>